Uh, thank you to, to tonight's event. We're really pleased to see you here. I happen to know there are some competing events going on, and uh, yet you chose to come here. That's really great. Hello, Monica. Schön, dass Sie da sind. I uh, there's a talk going on on the Ukraine at which the dean is actually speaking. I'm an associate dean, so uh, I probably would have gone to that except for this. So uh, I'm really pleased that so many people chose us over him. So that's really a great thing. I am. My name is David Ferries. I'm uh, associate dean for humanities, and I would like to start out tonight with a very brief. Uh, little talk they asked me to say something and what I would like to do is praise the Center for the Humanities in the public sphere I think it is a very very valuable part of our college um, they're one of the main avenues we have for interdisciplinary studies you know universities are structured like silos so that you you go into your department and all you see is a wall going up as high as you can see. It's very hard to look at problems from several different angles because they won't let you teach over in the next department or they won't, you, you know, they just see everything from their own point of view. So we need centers to bring people in from diverse uh, backgrounds to look at problems from different points of view. This center is also one of the few points, the most important points of outreach we have in the college. Uh, we're all in there teaching our students and writing our books and serving on our committees, but just how often do we do something that is attractive to the general pub public or which is, helps faculty in other colleges uh, get better perspective on some of the things that are going on. Uh, the center is also a huge advocate for the humanities, something that I'm totally in favor of since I'm the associate dean for the humanities. Uh, you know, the humanities uh, recently have become an object of intense and very often negative press, commentary, and public scrutiny, and we need somebody to stand up for the humanities and say, and show what we can do and show how important we are. So that's something that the center has done very well, and so I would like to... Um, uh, what I would like to do is just give you a brief, very brief uh, survey of the kinds of things the, co the center has done like over the last three years. They've had, they've had over the last three years three major series of talks. One was about civil society with a question mark after it because I guess the implication is it's not too civil these days. Uh, they've also had one on humanizing conversations and one that was on the university, rehumanizing the university. and. So they hit on a lot of important topics, like one is, I guess, the main topic, and it's the topic of tonight, is social fragmentation. Our society is fragmented by various factors. One of them is, um, well, one of the ones I wanted to bring up, one of the most fascinating talks to me was about science. Um, turns out, after hearing that talk, I found out that it doesn't matter how much people know about science, they, their opinions of whether or not they believe in global warming or whether or not they believe in evolution pretty much depend on whether their friends believe in it or not because uh, the cost, the social cost is too high to them to, to, to believe something different from what their, their group believes. So that was fascinating. Um, we heard about politics, the Boston Tea Party. One of the main topics has been race. So we've had six talks on race. Tonight's talk is on race, studying racist, racist activists. Some of them have been very broad, the perennial racist divide. Others have gotten down to a kind of an uncomfortable level here. Uh, the dark legacy of the Johns Committee at UF, that was um, uncomfortable. So then we have the whole uh, question of gender. That's another thing that, makes society, that, that we use to divide society. And we heard about what evolution can't tell us about women's sex and work. We heard about ignorance, women, and excellent science. We also heard about humanities as a component of the liberal arts, and especially humanities and its relationship with all the other parts of our college and our university. So we heard um, the humanities and STEM. A lot of people in humanities are a little bit worried about STEM. It seems nowadays if you're not studying STEM, you're not really uh, making the governor happy or maybe even the legislature. 
whether or not there are plenty of jobs out there in STEM and whether or not we need people doing things that humanists do the best, like maybe write and reason and communicate. So uh, those are the, uh, some of the issues that were um, done. My, one of my favorite titles was, If You're So Smart, why, you aren't, why, why Are You Not Rich? Which people have been asking me my whole life. Uh, and uh, the implication of that being that no knowledge that does not lead directly to wealth is worth having. So uh, that was a very interesting talk. Finally, the uh, center has taken a, uh, the lead in showing us where the humanity, humanities of tomorrow might end up. So we've had um, a talk on re reinventing the humanities in the digital age. I don't know if you guys know that there's a new thing called digital humanities where we are able to base our studies on gigantic databases that before were not available. Uh, and there is even a digital humanities working group, which uh, I believe operates um, side by side. There was a talk on collaborating with strangers in and outside the humanities, and also something on career paths outside of academia for PhDs in humanities. All of these things are very useful to all the humanists here at the university. And so I would just like to sum up by saying that the center has proven itself to be of great value to UF and the wider Gainesville community. And um, I especially want to congratulate the center's leadership. Right now it's uh, Sean Adams, who's sitting right over here and who I'm going to introduce in a minute. Sophia Acord, who has from the beginning, been part of the backbone of this organization. And Bonnie Efros, who is off on leave. She's always got some fellowship to go somewhere, but she has had a very strong hand in a lot of these activities. And as I said, they have helped make this one of my favorite centers in the whole college. So I'll now turn the program over to Sean, who is the interim uh, director of the center. Thank you very much. Song. Well, uh, thanks, David. Uh, as he said, my name is Sean Adams. I'm the acting director uh, for UF's Center for Humanities in the Public Sphere. And I am here to introduce the speaker. But first, I want to just say that this talk is the sixth scheduled talk. It's actually the fifth to occur um, because we had one cancel. Um, and the series is entitled Civil Society on the Future Prospects of Meaningful Dialogue. And the idea was to have the first three deal with social fragmentation, and then the second half, the next three, deal with uh, how we open new spaces for dialogue. Um, the fifth talk that was supposed to go on that was actually canceled is going to be rescheduled, and so I want to tell you guys all the date and encourage you to show up. Uh, it's Monday, April 14th at 5.30, and the speaker will be Kyle Pouse-White, who is a philosopher from Michigan State, and he's going to be talking about bridging indigenous and scientific knowledges, multicultural solutions for climate change research. And it's going to be a great talk, and it's unfortunate that Kyle couldn't make it. Unfortunately, he's in Michigan, and, and as we in Florida know about intellectually, but we don't experience, it's actually been a bad winter uh, up north, and so he couldn't actually make it. Uh, it's also my job and my pleasure to thank our generous co-sponsors tonight, UF Smathers Libraries, the Hyatt and C.C. Brown Endowment for Florida Archaeology, UF's Honors Program, the Department of History, the Department of English, the Samuel Proctor Oral History Program, and UF's Office of Sustainability. I'd also like to thank the Associate Director of the Center, Dr. Sophia Aker, uh, and our assistants, uh, Megan Leroy and Sarah Harms, for all their work in making this talk possible. Phoebe Wilson from the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences helped with the publicity. And I'd also like to announce, and this is a fun thing for me to announce in the final, what was at least the scheduled final talk, is that we're having a reception with plenty of food and drink afterwards, and I want to invite you all to attend. Um, we're celebrating the end of our series, and we hope that you guys can participate in that celebration. We'd like to ask you to join the discussion by reserving your questions for the Q&A session. You'll have plenty of time for questions uh, for Dr. Blee. Uh, and this is my opportunity to remind you that if you'd like to join us on Twitter, we ask that you use the hashtag, I believe it's up there, UF Civil Society, all word, uh, all one word. Uh, what we'd also like to do is right now remind you to silence all of those cell phones. So if we see you texting, we'll assume that you're Twittering about the talk tonight. 
Um, on to our speaker. Uh, as a 19th century, I'm a historian of the 19th century United States, and one of my most difficult challenges in the classroom is actually getting students to comprehend the ways in which American slavery um, operated. And the idea that I have is to have them understand the way that slavery operated, but not necessarily sympathize, actually not, not necessarily, absolutely don't sympathize with uh, the idea of racial slavery. Um, and it's a delicate task, I can tell you. Uh, it's a very difficult and delicate task. But at least I have the luxury of historical distance. Uh, so in other words, even when students are struggling with this notion of what slavery was and how it operated, uh, at the very least they can see that it's a part of America's past. It's not part of America's future. Our speaker tonight, Dr. Kathleen Blee from the University of Pittsburgh, uh, has undergone a much more difficult challenge. And rather than addressing subjects that are tucked away safely in the past, Dr. Blee is going to talk about individuals and groups that are still very much active in the American public sphere. And although this series, which is based on the idea of civil society, uh, aims at encouraging dialogue, there are certain basic assumptions I think we can all agree that go along with that dialogue. Uh, generosity, equality, and respect, these are all necessary for civil discourse to occur, right? Uh, the subjects of tonight's talk, I'm afraid, uh, place themselves outside of those boundaries, very consciously. And yet, as our speaker tonight will explore, what can we learn from understanding them? And the stakes in this process, I would argue, are really high. Uh, and I can't think of a more thought-provoking way to conclude uh, at least officially, our year-long conversation about civil society. And I can't think of a better speaker to deliver it. Uh, professor Kathleen Blee is Distinguished Professor of Sociology and Associate Dean of Graduate Studies and Research at the University of Pittsburgh. She has held an impressive array of administrative and academic posts, uh, while perhaps more impressively keeping a very active research and writing agenda. Her first scholarly monograph, entitled Women in the Klan, Racism and Gender in the 1920s, was published by the University of California Press in 1991. And this was followed by a co-authored book with Dwight Billings, The Road to Poverty, The Making of Wealth and Hardship in Appalachia, and a sole authored work entitled Inside Organized Racism, Women in the Hate Movement. Lee's most recent monograph, called Making Democracy, How Activist Groups Form, was published by Oxford in 2012. Uh, Dr. Blee has won several awards for both her teaching and scholarship at the University of Pittsburgh. Uh, the Chancellor's Distinguished Research Award in 2004, the Chancellor's Distinguished Teaching Award in 2007, and the Provost's Award for Excellence in Mentoring in 2007. So that's an impressive triple crown. Uh, and with that, it is my great pleasure to turn the lectern over to Dr. Kathleen Blee, who is speaking tonight on studying racial activists, racist activists, sorry, what can be learned and what cannot. Thank you very much. I want to extend great thanks to both Sean and Sophia for an incredible visit here. I left Pittsburgh in the snow, and it was very pleasant to appear in the sunshine and warmth here. So I bring greetings from uh, Pittsburgh. You all gave us quite a drumming a little while ago, but uh, speaking on behalf of all my fellow Pittsburgh people, the, own, the thing that's, the best thing is to win the championship, but the second best thing is to lose to the people who are going to win. So you have a lot of fans pulling for you from Pittsburgh tonight. Um, so I'm very pleased to actually be invited to a series that's wrestling with some issues that I wrestled with my whole uh, career, which is the really difficult issues of how to have meaningful dialogue in a heterogeneous society like we have in the United States today. The, the idea of dialogue is commonly offered as a method to heal wounds and to build groups of people that have different interests and different experiences. And indeed, programs of civic dialogue have been very effective in resolving tensions that arise in societies with all kinds of divisions, divisions of social class, race, sexuality, nationality, language, and race. Programs of civic dialogue have moved societies forward in the aftermath of tremendous violence and hatred, 
like the truth and reconciliation uh, processes in post-apartheid South Africa and in post-genocidal Rwanda, as well as the mediating dialogues that are underway among contending gang members in some of America's toughest urban places. Now, a major principle of civic dialogue is that carefully listening to someone else's story without arguing and without voicing disapproval is a route into understanding that person's behavior and their ideas. That kind of listening doesn't require suspending judgment. It doesn't require that you accept destructive behavior, and it certainly doesn't require that you excuse evil. It simply means putting yourself in the role of the other, listening, as it were, to see the world through another person's eyes. That kind of listening can pave the way toward a shared future or may simply clarify, clarify points of disagreement. Tonight I'm going to talk about a very particular and very fraught kind of dialogue, or not really dialogue, more listening, uh, and one that I think poses thorny issues of ethics and of politics. And that's listening to racist activists. And I'm going to draw on my listening, my studies with members of the 1920s Ku Klux Klan and with members of contemporary neo-Nazi and white supremacist groups. Now these are people whose agendas put them, as Sean was saying, far outside the mainstream. People who openly declare themselves as enemies of almost everybody in this room. People who have not repented. They do not seek reconciliation or dialogue. And they're not in search of forgiveness or even light punishment. So I begin with the first ethical issue, one that's raised by the pres this presentation itself. The beliefs and images that are associated with what I call organized racism, these, these groups, are deeply offensive. They are, on their face, traumatic. They're traumatic to hear and they're traumatic to see. They are intended to damage their audiences, and they do. So I've decided tonight, and I don't in my work, not to talk about the beliefs of people in these groups because they don't need any publicity for what they believe. Usually when I give a talk, I don't show images either, because images of these groups portray a level of hate that's very disturbing. But given that we're talking about the difficulties of dialogue, I decided to show a few of the images. And I just want to say, I'm asking your forgiveness if these feel harmful. They are going to be traumatic, so just steal yourself. Um, I also want to note that the people that I'm showing in these pictures are not people who I interviewed or people who I'm going to describe here. Because another complicated ethical issue is that I'm bound to protect the privacy of people I interview at the very same time as the ultimate goal of my research is to create knowledge that undermines these groups. So there's a lot of thorny issues. The people I've listened to are admitted, self-described, proud, racist, and religious bigots. To them, the world is starkly divided into us and them. The us are a small group of dedicated racial warriors who understand that whites and Aryans are in peril. The them is everybody else, not only people who are not white and not Aryan, but also whites and Aryans who reject a racist agenda and are therefore, in their minds, simply race traitors. Over the past three decades, I've listened, first of all, to elderly people who smugly recount their membership in the massive 1920s Ku Klux Klan as the high point of their life. This is from the 1920s. These former Klan's members from the 20s when I talked to them, were annoyed and incredulous that other people like me passed a negative ju judgment on a Klan that they remember decades later fondly and benignly as just another community group, just a way we got together to celebrate. That's a quote. 
Now, to put that in context, this is the Klan, the 1920s Klan, that viciously attacked African Americans, Jews, and Catholics, calling for their expulsion from the nation and even their genocidal destruction. More recently, I've listened to young racist skinheads, people like this, whose knowledge of history is so thin that they can't explain what a swastika is or draw it correctly, but are determined to and willing to fight to the death for what they understand to be the ideals of the Nazi state. And I've listened to mothers who are homeschooling their children in order to make them racial warriors. In their homes, their refrigerators sport victory photos of the carnage created by the bombing of a federal building in Oklahoma City, which you remember, among hundreds of others, 19 children died there in a daycare center. And I've listened to white supremacists whose ideas about African Americans differ, not at all really, from those of the most vile slave traders two centuries earlier. Now, none of these people be tolerant. They don't engage in the kind of evasive or colorblind racism that permeates United States society, in which people hide their prejudices behind a cloak of racial acceptance. Among the people I study, racism is raw, it's explicit, and it's deliberately assaultive. They insist that whites are meant to reign in dominion over all people, and they fear and loathe all those who are not white, Aryan, Christian, and racist. It's not simply what they believe. That's, that's too shallow. It's what they are. It's their identity. It's what centers them in the universe what directs them how to act in every situation. To put it most starkly, for people like this, their life is given meaning by the desire to rid the country, or even the earth, of people like me and people like you. So why is that? Is there anything worthless learning from them? What are the costs, the dangers, the dilemmas, and the moral quandaries in this kind of listening? So tonight I want to suggest three things that we can learn by listening to racist activists that are important to know if we're going to stop these groups, but also then end with some dilemmas about the listening. Okay. First, the first thing we learn by listening to racist activists is we learn how important women are to the mission of organized racism in the 20 and 21st century. Consider the 1920s Ku Klux Klan, the largest racist movement in United States history by far. Three to five million members. Now, just to put this in context, this is about the 1920s. You can only be in the Klan if you are white, native-born, and Protestant. Three to five million people is a very big percentage of the po eligible population. So we're talking about a movement that was a majority movement in a number of communities. These people fought to ensure the supremacy of, of white native-born Protestants against all others. Unlike the first Klan after the Civil War or the Klans of the later 20th century, this mammoth 1920s Klan did not operate from the shadows. This is the Klan, 1920s, marching down the avenue in Washington. Rather, this Klan took center stage. It assembled thousands of members to march publicly and proudly down the streets of the nation's and state's capitals. It elected mayors. It elected governors. It flexed its political muscle passed a federal immigration law, which we still have, that set a quota on people from nations that the Klan regarded as racially inferior. Its meetings and rallies were publicized in regular local newspapers, and professional photographers documented its speakers and the tremendous audiences they attracted. Now, not surprisingly, historians have written countless volumes about the 1920s Klan. And most of these historians, although not all, did mention that women were in the Klan. As it turned out, a lot of women, probably about a half a million. Yet these women weren't very visible in the photos and documents that the 1920s Klan left behind 
So they didn't become very visible in the accounts that historians wrote. It was only by finding and listening to the former women members of this clan, decades later when they were quite elderly, that their place in this terrible chapter of American history became clear. By listening to the recollections of women who joined the 1920s clan, I learned not only how many women poured into this racist crusade, but also the hidden history of what they did. While their fellow clan's men terrorized those they disliked with threats of physical violence, clan's women created vicious campaigns of rumor and boycotts to intimidate and destroy their enemies. Rumors about Jewish businesses were whispered from Klan's women to their neighbors, and those businesses collapsed. Tales were spread about the alleged activities of Catholic school teachers, and they lost their jobs. Rumors swirled about the sexual proclivities of African American men, and they were forced to flee their communities. The 1920s Klan is often described by historians as less violent than other eras of the Klan, at least in part because the tactics of economic terrorism and expulsion practiced so effectively by its women do not appear in written records. They are only known, this level of terror and violence is only known by listening to these women. In modern day organized racism, women are similarly important but also similarly hidden. Looking at racist websites or reading the pronouncements of their spokespeople, today's racist groups seem almost exclusively male. Yet if you look inside these groups, the Klan chapters, the neo-Nazi groups, the white supremacist groups, it's clear that women are a substantial proportion, probably around 25% higher in some groups. So what do they do? Well, from the outside, it seems like they don't do too much. From the outside, racist women today seem to be pretty much appendages or victims of racist men. Indeed, racist propaganda often looks like this, projecting a traditional image of women as mothers of the Aryan race who are supposed to bear white babies to win the birth rate war against non-Aryans and support their warrior men in their fight for racial victory. Listening to racist women, however, it's clear that their place in organized racism is more active and more dangerous. In the wake of the federal investigations of organized racism after the Oklahoma City bombing, racist women were charged with ensuring the movement's survival and self-sufficiency as the movement started to go more and more underground. Women have been charged with being in charge of military preparedness, taking responsibility for emergency first aid and weapons training, along with their traditional role of white babies and raising Aryan children. Listening to these women, it's also evident that they're providing leadership, not in the public sense of being officials and spokespeople, but in the informal sense of being leaders, providing group uh, cohesion in the group, mediating conflicts, developing strategies, and nurturing a group identity. Racist men's leadership is typically manipulative, very distant from followers, contemptuous of rank and file, and dependent on the adoration of the masses for their self-aggrandizement. So the racist men uh, who are leaders are, are, are very removed from their followers and very sort of up on a pedestal. In contrast, women's racist leadership is more elusive, indirect, and personal. It's also probably a lot more effective and a lot more dangerous. As an example, consider a woman's approach to recruitment. Recruitment is a huge issue in the racist movement because it's constantly being depleted by criminal prosecutions and defections. As one neo-Nazi woman told me, quote, I have a way of just speaking up in grocery stores and department stores. I approach people out of the blue, but not as a Nazi. But if they look at something, I make a comment, and then that leads into something else because then they get in a conversation with me and I just try to explain some things. I don't bring up Nazis or anything. I just try to educate them a little bit. I throw out little things that might help them think. 
Not all racist groups, though, sideline their women members even in public. Today, an increasing number also uh, depict and worship racist womanhood as requiring a more aggressive stance, little different from the cult of violence male racist groups. As one woman told me, you can tell a lot about the caliber of a girl by her tattoos. If she's a tough fighting type, she'll have a whole bunch of homemade swastikas down her arms and not just professional ones, professional made ones. A second thing we learned by listening to racists that in the past and now is that culture and social life bring people into these racist groups, at least as much as does racial prejudice. So it's not only that people join racist groups because they want a vehicle to express their hostility to people of different races, they also join, as person after person told me, because doing so, steal yourself, seems like fun. I can't tell you how many times somebody told me this was fun. And that tells us something really awful but really important about organized racism. So when I listen to the nonchalant manner in which elderly former members of the 1920s Klan recalled as fun their time in one of history's most painful chapters, I began to understand how deeply that clan had merged into the white Protestant native born life in the communities in which it took hold. Actually, let's skip ahead. This clan from the 1920s staged graveside funeral services for its deceased members, it hosted sporting events, it ran father son tournaments. It put on weddings, baby christenings, and beautiful baby contests. It brought to town airplane shows and festivals and tent revivals with speakers who claimed to be escaped nuns and who titillated their audiences with lurid tales of sexual abuse by priests and of aborted babies buried in churchyards. In short, the 1920s Klan brought excitement, fun, to white Protestant communities across the country. Now, in another time, in a later time, its attacks on people of different races and religions would have seemed too extreme to attract people from the political mainstream, even with the pull of its social life and its entertainment. But in the 1920s, remember, explicit expressions of racism and religious bigotry were absolutely common, daily life among white native-born Protestants. It's how people talked, it's how people thought. The Klan easily eased into the fabric of daily life in that time and place. People really could literally join the Klan for fun. Think about how creepy that is. Today's racists are similarly pulled in by cultural and social factors, although in a different form. Some are literally brought up in the social world of racism from early childhood, learning to accept even the most virulent expressions of hate as ordinary talk. And I said I wouldn't tell you who people are, but I'll tell you this person because she's very famous. The baby who's being baptized is now the sole public leader of a woman's clan in the country. That's her clan baptism many years ago. As they grow up, their high chairs are scrawled with swastikas. Their crayons are boxed with racist flyers. They learn to read from, and I'm not kidding, Aryan alphabet books. The results are obvious. Toddlers who refer to Jews as the devil, children who learn to call non-whites mud people as easily as other children learn the names of video games. Adults, too, not just children, but adults, too, are eased into the world of racism through its cultural and social practices. They're pulled in a lot these days by white power music, an industry that promotes Aryan supremacy through internet music sales and concert tours. They're also brought in, especially young people, through the lure of violence, participating in brutal attacks even before they're committed to the beliefs of racism. They're brought in because they're targeted by racist recruiters, like the racist who recalled meeting someone at a store who, 
invited him to come over, cook a meal, have some fun, and only later found out that he had been at a racist event. And they're invited to events that stitch together racist work and recreation. Events that have group volleyball, sessions on making a successful marriage, concerts and parties tucked between cro uh, cross burnings and racist speakers. Creating an atmosphere that a skin had to describe his first rally to me as, quote, was just like a big reception, kind of like a big powwow, pleasant and no screaming, end quote. What's most scary, most disturbing in modern organized racism is not the pathetic groups of middle-aged clansmen who you see every once in a while parading around a public square, almost always wildly outnumbered by anti-clan demonstrators. What's most scary are the ads for toddler car seats and Aryan cookbooks that appear in white power newsletters and on electronic uh, chat boards. Because those create a space where family and friends become the lure into organized racism. It's this power of racist culture and social life that we see in Aryan weddings today, where white lace dresses and black tuxedos come embroidered with swastikas and rest on steel-toed boots. The awesome power of culture to normalize racism, I mean, just think about that, to make racism seem normal, is evident in the gathering of 400 neo-Nazis in Idaho by a visiting journalist from just a mainstream newspaper who described it as, and I'm quoting the journalist, it was so benign, everyone was so common, so average, so mannerly and nice. That was her report. As Hannah Arendt pointed out many years ago in her study of the German Nazi leader Adolf Heichmann, evil is powerful, but it's also banal. And finally, the third thing we learn by listening to racists is that the inside of organized racism can be much different than it seems from the outside. And this is the one thing that gives us some hope. So what are the differences? One difference is that from the outside, if you look at the websites or the, what leaders of these groups say, organized racists seem full of bravado. They seem really sure of themselves. But listening to its members, especially the women members, but also the men, you hear a different story. Many of these people speak in terms of resignation rather than excitement, a sense of obligation more than a passion for racist activism. They talk about finding themselves in a movement they support, but that does not always support them, and they even hesitate about involving their children in the life. A few describe feeling empowered by being a racist activist, but most of them paint a more negative picture. And remember, these are the people who came in expecting fun. They talk of having make, made great sacrifices to be in a movement that gives them little in return. Their racist enlightenment, as they say, learning the truth, is something they see as a burden, an owner's responsibility, an unwanted um, something they didn't want, but they now know. As one Nazi member told me, if I had to do it all over again, I just wouldn't want to know what I know. Another difference is, is that while on the outside, racists seem steadfast in their beliefs, their private talk shows a much more complicated picture. I learned that Klan members admit that they didn't follow Klan dictates when they made decisions about their daily lives, when they decided where to take a job, so for example, you're not supposed to work in a place that has non-Aryans in it, how to raise their children. Nazi-affiliated women told me that they had had abortions, took birth control pills without taking their husbands, uh, telling their husbands, took their children to Jewish doctors, and so forth. Moreover, despite intense pressure to do so, most racist women and many men don't sever their connections to the outside, even though that is the bottom line in a racist group. These groups are semi-underground. You're not supposed to have contacts with outsiders. Nonetheless, they continue to stay connected to family and friends who deplore their racist ties, even to people who are members of the very groups that they are vowed to destroy. So 
interestingly enough, almost every woman I interviewed and many men confessed to having a relationship like that to an African-American in-law, a lesbian friend, a Jewish co-worker. A young neo-Nazi told me that her best friend was married to an African-American man and their children played together just when her husband wasn't around. The oddest one was an Aryan supremacist, who's actually still really involved in this movement, who told me that for she was involved in this lesbian-dominated goddess worship group. So I said, well, doesn't that kind of not work that well with your you know, Nazi anti-gay thing? And she said, ah, we're just great friends. None of us really believes that label thing. I mean, that label thing, she was living in a Nazi commune, okay? So it was kind of wild. So sort of marking her friends as sort of essentially her, even though they weren't. So publicly, these people concur with racist ideas, but privately, they act against those that intrude too deeply on their personal life. On the outside, their commitment seems unshakable. But by listening carefully, we know that racist commitment can be surprisingly fragile and that tugs from the outside can help bring them out of the racist world. And actually, I've been involved in some of the exit programs, if you're interested to hear about those. Of course, not everything we know, need to know about organized racism can be found by listening. For one thing, racist activists have a lot to hide. And it's difficult, as well as ethically problematic, to elicit, to elicit a lot of what we really want to know. So for example, we really want to know the extent to which these groups rely on funds from international traffic and arms or contraband. We want to know about their plans for terrorism and violence. And none of that is really going to be elicited by interviewing. Listening to these people also is unlikely to shed much light on whether these groups are cooperating across national boundaries, whether they're creating an international area and movement and so forth. So there's a whole bunch of stuff I want to tell you we'll never get by listening. Um, and in fact, listening as a strategy of getting information is itself imperiled by the increasing disorganization of modern racist groups as the groups are dissolving in favor of these loosely connected cells of activists so that they can better hide from law enforcement and by, from scholars too. Scholars use, to conclude here, scholars use, use listening, mostly in the form of oral histories, to record the lives of people who might otherwise remain inarticulate. From this tradition, this oral history tradition, has come a rich body of interviews with a lot of people we, f we admire and we like. Interviews with union organizers and feminist activists, civil rights workers, and others whose views most of us find laudable. So the oral history tradition has really given voice to a lot of people who would have been hidden. Less often do scholars listen to people whose agendas they find unsavory, dangerous, or deliberately deceptive. But doing so, I hope I'm showing you, can produce some insights that are not possible to gain by other means. On the other hand, it also raises some complicated ethical and political issues about the knowledge that's generated. And I want to end with two such issues. The first has to do with narrative. So we know that people make sense of their lives. They make sense of events in their lives by placing those events in storylines or narratives. So I'm stealing this from my friends in the humanities. Okay? So for example, when President Obama was on TV a couple weeks ago, he was describing his early life. And he talked about this was a time when he was without a father in the home. He was angry. He made bad choices about school and drugs. Okay? Now, note. This is a narrative that links together a series of events. No father, getting high, poor grades. And it links them together as a story. So there's a beginning, there's a middle, and an end. And the narrative is used to make sense of those events. So doing poorly in school was a result of a time of anger. As that anger dissolved, he was able to succeed in school. Okay, so all of us do that. We organize events and narratives. So I took that little foray into narrative to pose an ethical issue about listening to racists, which is, might such listening help these racists construct a narrative that makes sense to them of their racist actions, that makes sense of it to themselves 
and ultimately to a larger audience. After interviewing a female German Nazi leader, the historian Claudia Kuhns reflected, and I'm quoting, I realized I had come to get information, and she, the Nazi leader, intended to give me a sanitized version of Nazism that would normalize the Hitler state in the minds of contemporaries. She saw the chance to share her views with an American as a way of taking her message to not only a younger generation, but a new audience." End quote. So does listening help racists make sense of their involvement in a movement that's so destructive? Does it normalize, even sanitize, organized racial hatred as a political choice? It's just one choice among many, rather than what it is, which is an act of terrorism. I also worry about listening to racists for another reason, and that is that it might heighten the visibility and inflate the importance of organized racism to its members and to those it attacks. So P.T. Barnum, you all know, the 19th century American showman and circus owner, is credited with saying that there's no such thing as bad publicity. Is it the case that even highly critical or condemnatory research, like, like mine is, can inadvertently convey the import of historical significance to those it studies? Actually, I have reason to fear that it does. I found my writings on the 1920s Klan, which is a critical of the 1920s Klan, obviously, displayed proudly on the shelves of modern-day white supremacists as evidence of the place of the Klan the importance of the Klan in the history of America. That is pretty disturbing. Even more problematic is that scholarship based on listening to racists can inadvertently enable the very racial agendas that we're seeking to thwart. So when racist groups mount websites or when they distribute flyers, uh, post things, when they scrawl graffiti with their vile slogans and their messages of hate, they're not looking for members. People think that's they're out there on the internet because they're recruiting. Actually, they're not. You can't recruit on the internet because these groups are underground. You can't, like they don't have a, they don't have a place. You can't just show up and be a member. Um, so that's not why they're doing it. And anyways, they don't want members. They're trying to be small and terrorist cells. Um, the reason they're spilling their messages into public view is not for recruitment. It is to inflict acts of destruction on the audience, on the people that see it. They seek to inflict fear on, damage, and denigrate their enemies by putting those messages out there. Scholars can unwittingly become part of that agenda, which may explain why almost no white supremacist or group ever refused my invitation to be interviewed or observed, even though they knew up front that I would be negative. This might be the biggest ethical and political dilemma of listening to racists that we gain the understandings that are essential to combating these groups at the same time as we risk allowing these ideas and passions to reach new audiences. And that's a dilemma that unfortunately I have not been able to resolve. So thank you. Yes. Do you want me to? Or? Dr. Uh, Lee's great to Absolutely. Questions, so. questions, thoughts, comments? John? Mm -hmm. uh, a favorite writer that I look at, uh, Francis West Wells, writes about uh, uh, white genetic survival. She postulates that destructive racism comes out of the Middle Ages and a belief that literally that whites would disappear. So, with modern knowledge of genetics, well, why doesn't education and sophisticated modern knowledge unwind this kind of um, Interesting question. Now, just to contextualize, modern groups, they're extremely dangerous, but they're extremely small. Okay, so they have a particular take on race that's quite peculiar and off the mark of mainstream white understandings right now. In the 1920s, it's much more mapped more closely. But the racist groups now 
promote the idea and deeply believe in this idea of racial suicide, kind of what you're saying, that, that the threat is the extinction of the white race. And so they, their image of their politics is that whites are the ultimate victims, not only economic or political victims, but literally genetic racial victims and need to take a stance. I mean, now why they believe this is a, another complicated story, but that really is their belief. And that's, that's what binds people together in this group, this sort of deep cons biological, conspiratorial, racist beliefs. Now, they don't, as I was trying to indicate in this talk, they don't start out with those beliefs. So if, if you talk to people who know these, these people before they were in the racist group, they're like your average amount of white racism, if you, if you can sort of imagine. They, they're like, people don't think about these people and dial it back to when, before they were in the racist group and say, oh, I always knew, you know, this person was really out to lunch in high school. No, they're like average white racism. It's only when they get in these groups um, that they learn, this, this kind of racism is really learned, this really deep conspiratorial, um, complicated uh, set of, of racial ideas is something that is a product of the group and it's, it's the hidden knowledge. When I was saying people were saying that they wish they never had that knowledge, well, th that's, that's what they learn in the group, this, this secret knowledge is imparted to them as a virtue of being in the group. Yeah. Yeah. De details. <laughs> you gotta kind of get into a different mindset to get this. Um, it would seem like kind of a contradiction, right? But first of all. I'm not talking about this particular person. Actually, I might be. But um, people in this movement are extremely attached to the symbolic and extremely light on the historical detail. So would they know that the United States was actually on the other side of the war? Maybe not. Okay. Um, so actually, what's unusual about this is is that most Nazis, U.S. Nazis, neo-Nazis, are now anti-American. So they, any, this is, the picture's a little old. Now you would almost never see them with American flags because they're into this pan-Aryan internationalism and they, they make the argument that the United States government, especially at the federal level, is completely dominated by Jews. So they call it Zog, Zionist occupation government. So they would never, hold an American flag, so this is a little bit dated. But trying to like get the logic of this is kind of a futile quest, because. Um, there's an interesting phenomenon, which is that people think that there's a continuum from the very far, far right all the way to, you know, to the mainstream right, but actually there's not. There's a huge, huge gulf. So um, people on the far right will sometimes try to pull people from what they perceive to be people in the mainstream right to pull them over like Confederate groups. It almost never works because th what they believe is so radically different. Just to give you one example, almost all far right groups are really pro-abortion, just to take one, because they see it as a race strategy and stuff. So there's so many huge gulfs. So it turns out there's a lot of contestation when they try in groups that they perceive to be on the mainstream right because these racists try to pull people off, but it's, it tends to not be a good strategy. 
The other reason, they also are all interested in groups that have access to guns. So they're often trying to recruit for arms. Yeah? Yeah? Uh, at the point of practice, every time you present yourself as somebody that you're interviewing, were you ever caught in a situation where you had to tell them your identity, how you identify? And if so, how do you insulate yourself from that? Yeah, that's a really good, did you hear the question about how I dealt with it? Um, for one thing, when I s contacted groups or observed groups or anything, I was extremely upfront about my ideas, my politics, and my scholarly goals, and extremely uh, not upfront about anything about my personal self. Okay, um, so that was a kind of a fine line to walk, but it was important for a couple of reasons. One is they had to know that I was going to say negative things about them because, first of all, it's a, you get a lot of blowback if you don't. Um, but also, I didn't want them to think that there's any possibility that I could be recruited, right? So there's a, a danger there. Um, and I had to build up some kind of trust here. But so I'd say, you know, here you are. I'm way over here. You know, I don't like anything you're doing. So we had to have that kind of conversation. But in terms of anything about me personally, except for, you know, I'm a professor here and here's my writing, I really stayed away from that. Now, that's not to say that it didn't come back at some points and I got in some bad situations, but it, it, it's, a, it's a tricky area to walk. People like to talk, they'll talk, you know, they perceive me as white, so that was kind of good enough, but if you want to push at it, it gets kind of, N not so good, yeah. Um, so when you interview, like how valid is your sample size? Because I feel like the people who are willing to confess and say, oh, I have gay friends or, you know, my kids play with, like, you know, a black kid or something, uh, how can you tell if that, like, truly represents a large, like, portion of the plan or maybe that's just someone who's disgruntled and kind of willing to take a chance? Okay. I'll you're urging me, I'll put on my sociology hat for just a minute, I promise it won't be longer than that. So that's a great question because racist groups are, are on the border of underground, semi-underground, so there's not what sociologists would call a sampling frame. It's very hard to figure out if they're representative because we don't know what the underlying population is. So the way I did this study is let me back to it. Usually when people study groups like this, they do what's called snowball sampling. They find one person who introduces them to one person and they build up a sample. But that would run into exactly what you're saying, which is that you would get in this little corner of people and you think you have findings, but it turns out you're all just in a little corner and you no, have no idea. So I spent a long time, a year before doing um, a survey of all racist groups in America at that time, and then I drew a, a sort of stratified sample of groups, and then I made contacts to the groups to get to a person. So I didn't, so there is a, a sampling method. Now, it's not the Gallup poll, you know, it's not nationally representative, but it's, it's not a complete snowball sample sort of in between. But that's a terrific question. You should be a sociologist if you're not, <laughs> yeah? Did you ever feel like in the interviews that you conducted that your safety was ever threatened? Or did you get those? Because you said like you got into some bad situations. <laughs> uh, yes. My safety was, this is a really bad idea for a project. So don't anybody, <laughs> no really, I don't know why I didn't realize how bad of an idea it was until I was too deep into it to realize what a bad idea it was. But it's even got to be a worse idea. So if you have this idea, don't do it. It's really, that group world is really dangerous. And yes, I got into bad situations. And now, the, what you could sort of think of as the analysis of this is w one of the pulls of these groups, what pulls people in and what keeps people in is these groups are incredibly violent. So. Before I got in, I thought they were violent in the, same, in the sense that they're trying to commit violence against their enemies. It, absolutely, that's true. But they're also, violence is like a cult. It's like the way they operate. So there's a tremendous amount of violence within the group, of 
self-inflicted violence, of kind of playing on the edge of violence, of, of throwing gasoline around and getting drunk. And, you know, there, there's just a lot of stuff. So sometimes I felt I got into bad situations that were charged because of me as a scholar. But most of the bad situations I got in were more like that. Like somebody would pull a gun, and it really wasn't a gun at me. They were, you know, drunk, and they, you know, was, they were going to shoot, and, you know, you, you could be a casualty. So that, that, which is an interesting insight into the group. Now that I got out of it, I see it as an insight. Then it just seemed scary. <laughs> similarities like psychologically or emotionally between um, entry and exit from this kind of group? I mean of the people? Yeah, like you talked a little bit about um, people who leave. Yeah, this is a really... The, sort of the entry and the exit. This is a great question because when people look, if, if I asked you what a racist looked like, if I brought somebody in with me who is a racist activist, which I wouldn't, but if I did, they would look exactly like your stereotype, exactly, okay? They would be kind of disheveled, they would live in a trailer, they would have no job or hardly any job, they wouldn't have any friends, they would be exactly what you think. So people tend to look at, at that in a kind of what sociologists would call a cross-sectional way, one point in time, and, and use that as an explanation. So we say, oh, they're racist because they're socially isolated, they're economically marginal, you know, you know whatever, okay? And so we use their characteristics as an explanation. But if you actually, if you dial it back to before they got into that, they look, to all these people look totally different. In other words, you dial them back to before they got into the group, they were in college, they had a middle class job, they had a decent family, okay? And what happened? Well, you get into a racist group and, you, you know, you join a skinhead gang, you join a neo-Nazi group, you, you ease into it, which is usually how it happens, and then all those things happen to you. You know you show up for work with a swastika, man, you're fired. I mean, people are not into having employees with swastikas. You know, you start going to your family's Thanksgiving, if you're a white person talking, you know, Nazi stuff, your family's like, don't come back. You know, your friends give up on you. Pretty soon, you become the stereotype. But, but you didn't start out that way. So that's not really the explanation how you got out. So if you look at people who are in racist groups, if I brought somebody in right now, they would seem completely crazy. You would say, people in racist groups are nuts, only nutty people are in racist groups. And they would seem nutty. I mean, they would just talk in the circular way. They would have all these ideas that are just patently bizarre. Um, but that's because that's what they learned in those groups. They, they didn't start out that way. And that's a really important and really disturbing thing because it means that if you're a white person, they're a lot more like you than us than we might want to think. You know, they're not really like these super different people it can never be like me or anybody I know. They're kind of like me or other people I know, and they become nutty, yeah. And do they become unnutty after they exit? Um, that's a longer story, yeah. I, that's a long, long story. I'll talk to you, sort of and sort of not. They become nutty in a different way, I'd say. <laughs> yeah. In the 20s. Not now. Okay, so organized racism today is very heterogeneous. It's tiny, but it's quite heterogeneous. So I'm lumping together here a bunch of groups that actually have somewhat different ideas, clans, white supremacists and stuff. Um, but as a generalization, they tend to be um, atheist, anti-religious not just atheists, but sort of hostile to religions, including Protestantism, which they see as influence uh, taken over by Jews. Um, and they've embraced this um, philosophy, is too kind a of word, this set of ideas called Christian identity, which actually is kind of an old set of ideas, came out of um, England a long time ago. But 
it, it's a kind of a rewriting of the Bible, of parts of the Bible, as a racist tract. So it's very convoluted. Nobody I ever met in the group could explain it for more than two sentences. I actually am much more conversant in this than any of the people I ever met. Um, but the, one of the, it has two core beliefs. One is that Jews are the literal descendants of Satan. Okay, that's like a game changer idea because anti-Semitism historically, historians can correct me, but it's based on the idea that Jews are in league with the devil, but not that Jews literally are the devil. Okay, so if Jews are really literally the devil, it's sort of your need is to exterminate Jews. Right? I mean, that, that's a totally game changer idea. Um, their other idea is that persons of color, broadly written, are, uh, ex are descendants of beings prior to Adam. So it's a rewriting of the Bible. So Adam and all the descendants of Adam are white. So it's, it's the absolutely deepest, most virulent, vile rendering of racism and anti-Semitism, and it's caught on like wildfire. So they are, they would say they're religious, but that's what they mean. They mean they're religious because they're in this thing called Christian identity, which has no relationship to Christian. Okay, but that's just the name of it. So it's really deeply creepy. Yeah? Why do you see the change in demographics in the country? <coughs> Um, they are very attuned to the changing demographics as part of their whites are about to be extinguished philosophy of life. So it kind it fuels or substantiates to them that point of view. But these groups, uh, they're not trying to become big. And so I don't imagine they're going to become big. I, I don't think we're not talking about the groups that are out here today are not going to be the 1920s clan. You know, that, that's not their agenda. That, that's not their purpose. They want to stay small. They want to stay under the radar. They want to stay nimble because they're really focused on terrorism, not um, building a mass movement. So right now, it probably doesn't have that much of an impact on the groups except to confirm to them their own reading of racial history. Yeah? yeah. Um, thank you for the presentation. I certainly enjoyed it. My question is, I guess it's very easy as a liberal, progressive academic who's also benefited from white privilege to see the, uh, these extreme maybe white or white supremacist groups and sort of distance myself from them at, at, in, as a way of cleaning my conscience or mm -hmm. feel uh, more politically superior. So my question as far as attacking that sensitization is what do you see or what have you found in your research that can that might cause or prompt every single person that's benefited from white privilege to look in the, the mirror? Well, I think actually one thing that's important to contextualize these groups, so these groups are really small, and this is a, a, an issue of sort of organized violence. And to the extent that we think this is racism, that does exactly what you're saying. I mean, I, I think that the ten, there is a tendency in society to say, well, these are the racists, so all the whites who are like not Nazis, no problem. And that, I think, is, is one of the biggest dangers. So I think of the people who are doing the work on, you know, colorblind racism and, and institutionalized racism and, you know, that, that's really the core of what's going on in racism. This is the core of what's going on in racial terrorism, 
But this is not what's going on in racism. And this can really deflect from the other. I think you're absolutely right. To go back to your first um, problem at the end, and that was uh, the question of that you sometimes want to know what you cannot be allowed to know because you don't really want to know the illegal activity, but you really actually care about it. And so I'm interested in how much that has to do with your scholarly identity. And so it would be different for law enforcement, but it might also be different for activism. But then you also talked about yourself as an activist to a degree with the exit program. So I wondered whether you can think about that dilemma as a, in relationship to scholarship, le law enforcement, and activism, because it seems to me it's different. And so the question is, is your dilemma a scholarly dilemma, or is it a dilemma in relationship to those groups in general? Oh, yeah, that's a good point. No, I think it's a scholarly dilemma, because one could elicit from them the kinds of information I said I couldn't. I mean, I, I can't elicit it because I can't protect it. Now, this is the weird thing about being a scholar. I have to, I'm both trying to undermine these groups as groups, but I have an ethical obligation not to undermine, not to, you know, destroy the person I'm interviewing by virtue of the interview, right? So I'm, uh, they have to trust that I'm not going to turn them into the police or collect incriminating information about them in the process of the interview. So I have to get them not to tell me things that they would have, even though the bigger agenda is to kind of do that. So it is a really weird uh, dilemma. Now, the interesting thing is these groups are proud of that, right? It's not like if you interviewed you know, if I did something illegal, I'd probably be a little shy to mention it. But not a problem in these groups. I mean, that's, that's their thing. They're, that's what they're proud about. So they're dying to tell me. So I went in thinking, you know, well, they're never going to tell me anything. Oh, no. By, you know, quite the contrary. They would have told me everything. You know, everything they planned. It just... They told me everything. So I had to always say, wait, we're not, we're not going to go there because I don't want people to tell me things that are criminal that then, then I have information about criminal activity that makes them vulnerable. So it's a, but it is kind of weird, like you're protecting and undermining people the same way. And I wish I had an easy answer to it, but I think it's a huge dilemma, right? So I, I'm trying to... Also, you know, gather information that's helpful for disabling these groups. So I've been able to come up with information about how people exit, what makes an exit, and that is a disabling part, but that's disabling the groups, not targeting the particular people I interviewed. It's kind of angels on a pinhead, <laughs> maybe. I've heard you two personas that people that you're listening to take. One is Nirvana and look at me, look at all these things I've done, and the other is this more nuanced, especially among women, delicate, second guessing, I'm not sure, I don't feel supported by my community stuff. Could you talk a little bit about your, what your take is on that tension? On one hand, I want to tell you when I want to hear you to hear all the bad things I've done, and on the other hand, I'm not even sure I like being here and doing what I'm doing. Does that make sense? It makes sense. That's I don't know what to say except that's exactly what a lot of people are like. They're, they're all the bravado about the group and, you know, the racial war they're going to win and yada, yada. And then, like, what have I got myself into, you know? Because just remember, one thing about entering a racist group, you can't get out. It's not like you just change your mind, right? You, you know information about people. They don't just say, well, change your mind, goodbye. You, there's no real safe way. There is a way to get out, but it, it takes support and all kinds of measures. It might change your need to change your identity and stuff. So, getting out is not an easy thing. And may and I think people don't necessarily. First of all, they don't necessarily realize how trapped they're going to be when they get in. Um, but also, it's kind of a. It's an unpleasant world, you know. Despite all the bravado, we're going to win the race for and all this stuff. You know, the reality is, 
you know, they live pretty crummy lives and they're kind of on the run, you know, they're really marginal economically and socially. People, you know, to the extent that people know what they're doing, people hate them and, you know, say all kind of hate things to them. And, you know, it isn't, I mean, I feel like, well, you chose it, but it isn't, you know, from their point of view, it's not really a great life, but, and they're kind of blocked in. So, I, but I think they're both things, you know, the racial warrior and the kind of defeated person at the same thing. So, but that's, those exit programs have that problem, you know, because people like exit and then they want to go back in, out, in, out, you know, because, because they're both things, you know, like I want to get out, but then wait a minute, what about the race war we're about to win? And, you know, so they go back and forth. It's really weird, but um, you can go, some of these people can go pretty far before they get it. So, like this example, this is a white power band. Um, you know, so we're often talking about very young people. Okay, they, they have attracted a lot of young young teenagers, right? Um, high school kids and stuff, and. You know, the, there's something pretty exciting to some of these teenagers. So it's like, it's forbidden. It's got all the violence. It's got the sort of street aggressiveness. Um, and a lot of these places take, take place in places that your parents have told you not to go. You know, parts of town you're not supposed to go to. You know, it has all that kind of in-your-face quality that appeals to your average 14-year-old. Um, and... They can go remarkably far. And just remember, just, I don't know if you have younger brothers or sisters, they don't know nothing about history, right? Like nothing. So, I mean, at least my kids, nothing about history. So you think like, wait a minute, didn't they notice the swastika? Or like, didn't they notice the Iron Cross? Well, it just doesn't like click to them because they don't have a context. So it's like, you know, more like tough stuff. And they can go unbelievably far before they really get it. And then they're bonded. And then they start getting the secret information. That, that's the turning point. So you start, then they start telling you, what, as you have picked up from this conversation, you're really into anti-Semitism right now, more than racism. So then they start telling you this, all the secret stuff that Jews are doing. And then you start noticing things about your life. This is, the, this is probably when you passed the watershed. You start explaining your life by Jews. So then people will say, you know, I flunked my math test. Darn, darn those Jews, you know, they wreck, you know, they got into my brain or they changed the answers or something. So they really start narrating their lives through those messages. And, and that is probably a point of no return because then everything, even negative evidence, is confirming. So if you can't see, if you can't pinpoint the Jew that did this to you, then that just shows how good Jews are being being hidden. So, you know, you really get into that circular conspiratorial logic that you can't get out of, and then I think you're in, have crossed. So. Thanks. Let's have another round of applause. Thank you. Remind me we have reception that's open, and thank you so much.